the chairperson of the Doha chapter of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, the management committee members, fellow chartered accountants, distinguished speakers from productivity, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues are also here, some of them. Thanks for the very generous introduction. I'm proud to be an Indian, proud to be an Indian child accountant. It's my pleasure and privilege. It's true, extraordinary set of a transformation taking place in the world. The first industrial revolution was confined to locomotives and cotton spinning. And the second industrial revolution was confined to more of assembly lines and electricity was moving like fire. The third one was recognition of the fact interconnectivity, interdependency of the wall through computers, mainframe or personal computers, Internet of Things again. Now what we are witnessing, what we are going to see as a huge transformation in our personal life, professional business modeling, is exciting, enriching in this knowledge society. It is transformative, it is decisive in substance. In terms of global economics, in the spring meeting, I was with the deputy governor today afternoon. I couldn't attend the, the spring meeting, uh, annual meetings they attend, and those they attended, the prime topic was digital governance. Even in the spring meeting last week, it was digital governance, blockchain, artificial intelligence, RPAs, APIs, robots, it's all happening. It's real. Conceptually, hundreds of billions of sensors are going to reignite the convenience. At the same time, we have to be cautious in recognizing. It changes the way we live and operate on this planet. While planet is committed for enduring values, we don't want to be clowned as mission model. Machine learning is important. Artificial intelligence is important. But we also have to understand the world at large has to transform for sustainable endurance of humanity, human prosperity. While we have committed norms to eradicate extreme poverty, you also have to recognize gender equality is vital. We have seen women participation. This time, chairman as well as chairperson as well as the vice chairperson are ladies. That's good, good sign. We recognize that universal education is vital. Somebody introduced me <laughs> that I, was, I taught tuitions. That's true having come from a very middle-class family. My father was a teacher. And I, I said to myself, I will not pass the burden, to, burden of my education to my parents. I found ways and means of subsidizing, subsidizing my education. And it was useful, quite productive. I used to teach when I was studying 8th and 9th standard, 10th and 11th mathematics. The consideration was books. That was quite helpful for me to be determined, determined and drive my vision to execution. Thanks for the comments. The universal education is vital. Universal health care is vital. Enrollment sustainability, again, it's absolutely vital for us to see through. Global warming and climate change is measurable, manageable, and controllable. 
sustainable development agenda is going to give long-term prosperity for humanity and human dignity, for which we need to build partnership, global partnership. Technology and the digital evolutions which we are witnessing now as, as a transformation exercise is true. The substance is to add value to humanity. And that's what precisely we can converge in positive terms. That's a bigger opportunity. The digital revolution is going to reignite the convenience, as I said, and also gives you enough opportunity to redefine, set your own agenda in this planet. That's the fourth industrial revolutions. The bigger picture is to be financially inclusive. How do we bring in income inequality to equality? How do we transform this? How do we produce gross welfare to the mass? How do we create enough infrastructure for us to see through every part of the human prospect is living with decency and dignity? Technology can enable you. It is supporting the mission. That's why the global agenda today is to be inclusive, financial inclusion. Financial inclusion without digital inclusion, digital governance, is of less substance. A policy framework, if it is not converging with the digital governance, you are not going to execute within the standard time. And that's what we have lessons we have learned. If you look at the, the bigger picture in terms of advanced economies, even the spring meeting is, is a revolution. They are grossly underperforming. While the global growth has been projected upwards, conflicting policies within the developed economies and within the developed economies and developing economies, per se, is, is creating huge reorganization in the functional makeup, whether it is global trade. America has got a different perspective. They're transcending the new rules. Trans-Pacific partnership is getting challenged. We also seen the reflection of NAFTA being rescinded. We don't know what's likely to come on 12th of this month when Security Council of prime countries, excluding America, is on the one side, whether to renew the, the agreement which global powers have signed, including China and France and Germany, UK, United States, are to rescind the terms and conditions agreed in Geneva in 2015. What sort of reorganization is going to come out of this? What sort of political sanctions will, will again crop up? We don't know. Advanced economies within the segments, if you look at it, America is said to be recovery. They are increasing the interest rate. We have seen inflation is coming up. Unemployment is getting under control. Jobless claims are less. But sustainability is at stake. If you start rescinding the WTO mission, then you are going to have a bigger challenge. Trade has to be renegotiated. We also seen euro within the developed nations bucket. They have to inflate. Still, convergence of a fiscal union. Monetary union is one aspect. A fiscal union has to come in. Then only you can set in the kind of consolidation which you require. Countries within the Euro definitions, live beyond their means, have to come to terms. The gross debt to GDP, if you look at the advanced economies, is not in good shape. They cross the borders. They're living on the borrowed money. It's true. That's the problem for the advanced 
economist. You know, it's said to be doing well as a federation in large euro. But as a design, it has got its own deficits. As I said, the monetary policy is centralized. Fiscal policy is decentralized. Fiscal union is, is a solution. It means political union has to come together. The convergence of politics and economics is the solution. Will it happen? The Maastricht Treaty is set in with the right kind of agenda. The principle-centered values which they converge is not happening, but still scoring reasonably well. The monetary policy is effectively administered. We have a 2.1% 2, 2 growth definitely there for next year. When it comes to UK, with Brexit still under negotiation, it's a bigger challenge. It's an opportunity as well as a challenge. It remains to be seen what sort of reorganization will, will happen in terms of trade and investments. And 1.5% is the projection IMF dictum says. Japan is recovering. 1.2% is possible. So this is the essence of the advanced economies. What's happening on the emerging economies? Emerging economies is an incremental engine, economic engine for the world. 45 to 4.7% incrementally they can add in global productivity. But they have their challenge. The institutions have to be strengthened, whether it's judicial or Structural realignment is required for us to see through. Legal validation is there for human rights and prospects. Infrastructure investments, trillions of dollars are required, whether it's India or the rest of the emerging economies, to reignite and sustain the momentum. That's a challenge for the emerging economies. Within the emerging economies, we have India is doing extremely well. The scorecard still says, arguably, India is a better performing economy in the world. We have 7.4 to 7.6 percent growth is possible, possibly more next year. Fiscal consolidation is a challenge. With oil price costing over $75, $80, now it remains to be seen what sort of monetary makeup we need to come to terms. Inflation will go up. And again, Cross to GDP should be moderated. Low income countries, if you look at, they have a bigger opportunity. But again, in terms of transparency and governance, whether it's Africa or the rest of the low income countries, continents, they have a set of challenges which are structural again. Inclusion, financial inclusion, is also a major challenge. Now, this is the bigger picture in terms of global economics and the uh, digital governance. What does it mean to you in terms of the topic which has been set in today? There are, there's an expert. It's all econometrics, end of the day. Digital governance, if you are not recognizing as an opportunity, financial inclusion, if it is not recognized as an opportunity, it can degenerate in terms of productivity and functional makeup, and the scorecard can be offended. That's the point we need to conceive. India itself is a telling story. Financial inclusion, there's no other country which has done exceedingly well than Indian model. The last two years of IMF agenda starts with the bigger picture, India's financial inclusion as a designated model, the rest of the countries to replicate. It's not easy bringing everyone into a digital agenda. The structural reorganization took place in terms of cashless society was, was a challenge politically. Nobody can rescind the fact that that's the way to go in respect to the uh, political discussions. Financial inclusion is not an option. Digital governance is not an option if you have to sustain your meritocracy and reduce the income inequality. You have to necessarily make sure the social security or pensions or disposable income comes in the hands of every common man. 
India is today arguably is an extraordinary opportunity. In 2030, we are talking about five to six point eight trillion dollar economy. Between 1.5 to 1.7 trillion is the minimum infrastructure investments. E-commerce market itself is over three trillion in the next three years. And we have seen the market liberalizations. FDI has, is growing in the right directions over, over the years. If you look at it, what we have procured in the last three years itself is $194 billion. It's ranking sixth in the global FDI movements. That's not ordinary. The future is very bright for India. Everyone recognized this, a global community looking at India, whether International Monetary Fund or World Bank or IBRD or United Nations today is looking at India with great prospects. The functional democracy is paying its own price. That's part of the game. But it's a package. We all have to come to terms. The diversity and oneness, the value streaming which is emanating, and the opportunity it, it's, it provides is extraordinary. It's a regeneration in, in real sense. You should see it to believe it. And that's what the uh, global community recognized. Digital governance is the solution. All this fourth industrial revolution's components, if you call it as components, simply because so much to invent and reinvent and converge in real order in terms of policy maker is going to provide better opportunities for everyone. Now, if you look at the blockchain, that's the topic today, blockchain and cryptocurrency, it's not something extraordinary. It is absolutely transformational in business model. Technology is evolving, as I said, industrial revolution one, two, three, four. These changes are ascending in real order in concerns with the changes in the demographic dynamics. It's required to cope up with the, the human development. The human experience which we are going to see today is extraordinary. The change in the business model is real. That's extraordinary for you. The changes which are happening in today's context in terms of digital governance through blockchain as a distributed ledger is enormous. The banking side, I can tell you, it's much more secure. It's much more transparent and transformative in substance. The distribution architecture is going to reignite the way we do the business. Even banking as a structured solution, as an intermediary, professional intermediary, is going to go through huge amount of transformation. You don't require a bank in for many of the functional financial makeups. You don't require. If world at large is recognizing you have an architecture which is end-to-end -end can be connected between B2B, B2G, or C2C. The transmission can take place in secured form, encrypted forms. Then what do you require? Why do you need a bank? Think about it. It could be remittances. It could be trade. It could be loan sanctioning. As long as you have a secured functional makeup, as long as you have transparency, as long as you have a digital strength which can reignite the convenience, cost, and the speed, and essence, and, and measurable terms, then you have no need for intermediate to come in, step in. And that's a change. It's a huge change. It's a distributed architecture where you have connection in transparent terms getting broadcasted in front of you. You can measure it. You can track it. And you can, again, authorize it and everything is known to everyone in secure, digital, encrypted form, and everything gets transmitted in no time, a fraction of a second, perhaps a fraction of a cost. That is blockchain for you. Countries have recognized this either through the fintech as a substantive model, whether regulators run it or you as an independent enterprise runs it, but you have to converge. There's less choice. The option is enduring in terms of substance. It can be in the corporate side. As I said, trade could be an option. Even program learning is already now on digital frame. 
business process outsourcing, knowledge process outsourcing are integral part of the internet long ago. Now it is converging to a bigger scale where you can eliminate the middleman. If it is professional intermediary as an institution like bank, so be it. That's the advantage you have. World at large is recognizing. Countries are setting up their own infrastructure in terms of blockchain. Gulf states are not an exception. Global chains are not an ex exceptions. It's not only in Silicon Valley it's happening. MasterCard is already switched on without a magnetic device. It is cashless. It is through blockchains. Money can be transmitted. And settlement can take place. Payments can happen. Clearings can take place. So it's, it's a huge transformation, even from a banking revenue stream perspective. E-commerce is going to dominate, and the substance lies in tools like blockchain. And we have countries are adopting in a bigger scale. Now, G20 meeting is scheduled in Argentina in the coming days. And they're going to discuss the first item is the digital governance, and blockchain plays a bigger agenda in, in substance. Even within the region, if you look at it, Arab ch chain, Dubai is already experimenting. Institutions are also engaged in it. Now, I can talk about institutions, financial institutions have already created the prototypes. How much they are in execution, it remains to be seen. But it can be effective. It can be effective in terms of corporate side. It can be effective in terms of retail space. It could be a remittance into it. While we have money transmission has been simplified through digital currencies, digital advantage, I've been doing in this country since 2003 onwards, 2002 onwards, through global chain. Based on the dynamics, demographic dynamics, we engaged with the correspondent banks and we, we created the prototypes. And money gets transmitted through collaborations. That can be replicated through blockchain. It's much more secure instantaneously. When it comes to treasury and investment side, again, it's whether it's trust or will, you as an individual, we as an institution can, again, can interconnect it and make sure that distribution takes place in front of you in secure architecture. And you can see in transparent terms, everything is sequenced properly. Everything, everything is encrypted. Everything is authenticated. Everything is measured. Everything is managed. Everything is under control, under your control. You are empowered to see through. Everything is end-to-end -end measured and managed and controlled. That's what I mean. That's an opportunity. Now, when it comes to cryptography, you, you know what is cryptography. If it is encrypted in virtual digital currency, then it becomes cryptocurrencies. Now, I'm not going to believe in cryptocurrencies. As a banker, I don't vouch off. Monetary policy is, is centralized. Fiscal policy is decentralized. It is illegal to authenticate money supply other than one monitor. Currency is a barometer of an economy. You, don't, you can't manipulate. It was substituted in 2008 and 9, I was in J.P. Morgan the conference in 2008 in September, a week before Lehman Brothers was collapsing at the very same time square. 139 years of Lehman Brothers as an institution. I used to jog and I used to stay in Marriott Marcus. In the morning, I used to jog. September 1st, I was attending this conference, JP Morgan Emerging Market Conference. I saw, I was cutting through Lehman Brothers building. Those who have seen Times Square, you can see the digital signs those days. And 15th was Lehman Brothers collapse. Uh, when I came back after IMF meeting, I switched on, I recognized the institution is no more. That's a different subject. but. The very same week, 
in Washington, D.C. The thought of digital and virtual currency substituting because while the financial community has recognized the subprime was a major deception in, in, in substance, but they substituted with liquidity as a tool. The equity crisis moved into funding, funding crisis moved into a solvency and sovereign issue. But virtual currency was substituted as a thought, as a thought. Now it's effectively, it is in the hands of many people now. Bitcoin is one of the tools. There are hundreds of virtual currencies that have been invented. But you cannot produce a currency. You cannot artificially insulate a currency in substance because currencies, if it, if it is in the hands of common man, it can be speculative. So personally, professionally, I don't recognize anything other than a central bank should produce the money supply. Now, it doesn't mean they should not discuss. That's not the purpose of my statement. But the point is, a fiscal policy comes from the finance minister who, who understands the receipts and payments of the government. Money supply, interest rate, inflation, this comes out of the central bank. The, the quantum to be produced and the, the scale and substance and the security which needs to be designed and delivered is unique. You can have trading transactions in terms of digital reference. You can create a network which can be encrypted. You can make it as a settlement mechanism within that group. That's, again, it's not far-fetched in terms of transparency and governance. And that's why you have seen the high volatile sequence in the last few months, what Bitcoin was offering to the world. No regulators are ready, except few countries, a few institutions are engaged in such substance. Venezuela is talking about it. They want to create a a petrol currency in the form of encryption. It's secured. As long as you have mechanisms which are designed, you can create. But it's a settlement mechanism, but it cannot be called as a currency with, which desires the, the value chain for the economy, which is produced as a barometer. Now, why did they print money? You can ask me this question. World at large has recognized when it was liquidity crisis, when it was moving to a funding crisis, we had to print money to improve and inflate the economy. So you weaken the currencies. Trillions of dollars were printed by, uh, by, through additional money supply by Federal Reserve to start with. Then Bank of England did this. European Central Bank did this. Uh, Minomics was invented in in 2012, export to an economy like Japan, when it was technical and recession, if they have to inflate, if they have to, it means they have to weaken the currency. So they started doing it. So everyone is, is in the same bucket. That's, but you have to unwind. At some point of time, you have to pull it back, all the currencies which you have put in the market for inflatory, inflammation. And that's what precisely happened. When Federal Reserve started unwinding it, you have seen the reflection in the market space. The money supply gets degenerated, then it has, the balance sheet has to be subdued. And that's the process, quantitative easing. And that is nothing to do with this kind of speculative money supply. So if you look at the, the cryptocurrencies, whether it's Bitcoin or otherwise, they have a different agenda. No sensible regulators will tell you, I'll endorse this. India is not saying, Qatar is not saying, Federal Reserve is, is not responding. There are countries who are keeping quiet. They don't know what's the consequential impact of cryptocurrencies. It can be aligned. It's like an operating system. If you have bitcoins as an operating system, application is, Bitcoin, uh, rather, uh, blockchain is an operating system, bitcoin is an application. That much you can interpret. Whether it can be governed in global terms, universal norms can be set in for money supply, no. Who has to control it? The regulators have to come to terms. 
I don't know what Mr. Subhash has got in his, in his view. view. That's how I interpret as an economist or a banker or a, a child accountant. Because you have so much to measure in terms of money supply or interest rate policies. And you can't just speculate Warren Buffett is not going to invest. Countries who are engaged in high level of monetary discipline, fiscal discipline, will be very careful in endorsing such tools. It remains to be seen. It's an evolution after all. It's an opportunity for us to see through. There's an alignment in technology. While Bitcoin is absolutely recognizable, we have to endorse as a convenient mechanism cryptocurrencies. You have to be highly cautious. It's speculative in substance. But it can be synchronized. It can converge, as, an, as I said, as an operating system and application. And that's what I know as a banker. But the rest of all, in details, I'm sure, you'll have an interesting and exciting deliberations. And I have a, a function to attend. So if you can excuse me with these notes, I thank you one and all. I'm glad I could learn uh, much more on the subjects, but I'll definitely pick up the threads and try to have a continuing education on the subjects so that I can add future value as well. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.